and Michael Garrett, our uh, Ed Technology Center manager, is also going to be presenting. And our topic today is how you can improve your instruction using the different free apps available to you through the Google Chrome Web Store. So, let's get started so we can keep the process going pretty fast today. If you would like to look at the presentation afterwards, here is the available uh, do for it, and you can also use it with the QR code. And we'll have it up at the end if you'd like it then as well. So, okay. Sure. So I'll give you a little introduction to what the uh, the Chrome Store is and what it's not. So there's uh, you know a lot of different stores out there for different kinds of apps. Obviously, the iTunes Store, um, App Store. In re in the kind of the sphere of Google, um, they have the Chrome Store and then they have their Play Store. So the main difference is being um, the Chrome Store is for the extensions, apps, and um, themes that you would use for your Google Chrome browser. Um, it can also be used in some cases with other browsers, but that's the main environment where you would use that. Um, the difference then being with the Google Play Store is really for um, games, media, things that you might use on an Android device. In some cases, there's some overlap, but those are the main differences between those two environments. So then what is the Chrome Web Store? So I mentioned that it's a marketplace, right, for all these kind of Chrome um, uh, browser um, tools. Um, as with any kind of web store, you can also try things out there before you decide to download them. They have both free and purchasable items, descriptions, ratings, all the kinds of things you would typically expect to see in the store. Um, we have a little demo video that we'll uh, have available if you wanted to view that um, offline as well. So in terms of using it, of course, you can go in, you can install, like I mentioned, there's both free and, um, and uh, purchased apps. Um, one thing that we kind of encounter a lot is, you know, do I need to have an account? Do I need to have a Google Apps for Education account in order to use these? Um, you don't have to be logged in. You don't have to have a Google account or Gmail account in order to use these. In many cases, um, you can just download them, install them in your browser, um, if it's an extension or an app. Um, and continue on. If you want to have that integration um, to be able to take it with you, right, so you can open the apps or the extensions on other devices, um, then you would want to be logged in. And so that way, you know, bookmarks, all the things you kind of do in your Google environment will then follow with you. Um, but you don't necessarily have to be able to use those. In terms of uh, Google Apps for Education, uh, we'll show you a little bit in the store some differences in terms of the Google Apps for Education environment and, and how that how that. So differences between web apps and extensions. Um, an extension is basically uh, a tool that operates within the web browser to extend the functionality of the web browser. Okay, we're going to take a look at a few of those tools today, um, but they're really to enhance the functionality of the web browser. Um, by contrast, a web app is more of a standalone tool. In some cases, it may just be a website, um, but it's really a standalone tool uh, to add functionality to to you know, be able to do different things with um, in terms of performance and usability that aren't specifically tied to uh, the web browser. So where you would locate these, once you have them installed, and we'll kind of go through the process of installing them. Um, as you can see, there's a few different ways that you can get to them. So the URL you have right here, which is typically what you'd get when you open a new web browser uh, window. So Chrome apps, you can see your suite of apps. And typically, if you're just starting out, you'll just have store, Gmail, YouTube, those things on there. And as you add the apps, they'll be populated here. Um, you can also get to the apps at any time by clicking the multicolored square. It says apps in the upper left. Um, if you're on a Chromebook, it might look a little different, but that's typically how that's arranged. And extensions sit right here next to the Omnibar and 
as you populate that area, it'll get longer and longer until eventually it will just give you a little control to see a list of all of your apps that way, or rather all your extensions. Okay, so taking a look at some extensions, um, and let's go ahead and, and launch the web store so you can see what that looks like. And if you are at a computer, feel free to go ahead and do that as well. Um, you can just go to chrome.google.com slash web store. Okay. So you'll notice that we have a search bar here. We can obviously search for any specific things we're looking for. Um, you may want to browse. Typically, that's a good place to start if you're looking for uh, educational content. You'll notice a couple of things. Um, if you're logged in, um, or rather, if you're not logged into an account, or if you're just logged into a regular user account, you can always go to the education category or any of the other categories. If you're logged into a Google Apps for Education uh, account, you'll notice under collection there are a few extra categories that you wouldn't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. So under collections, we have elementary school, middle school, high school. Okay, so you can go into those focused categories there by being a Google Apps for Education account. So let's take a look at some of those. So I'm going to click on elementary school. Okay, and uh, under the show, I can see a few different types of tools that I can sort by here. So the apps um, that are available within the Chrome Web Store can be ones that run online or required, or required to run online. Okay, you need to have an internet connection to use them. But there are a few that will run offline. So if that's an issue for you, that you need to be able to do that. Um, you can see which ones those are. You'll also notice there are some gray icons in the corners of some of these thumbnails. Um, and those correspond to those. So the lightning bolt means that it runs offline. This uh, little symbol right here you may recognize as being um, uh, usable within the Google uh, Drive environment as well. Okay. So typically when you are sorting within a category, it's going to sort them by, and I'm going to click on education over here so we can see top level here. It's going to, sh actually I'm all in apps right here. Let me go back to the main view. So it's going to typically show you, for example, if you do a, a search, a keyword search, and I'll just do screen capture as an example. There are a lot of tools for screen capturing. So you can see it's sorted by apps and then extensions. So we're going to take a look at extensions to start with. And one of the tools that you know we think is really powerful and useful uh, as an extension it is a screen capture tool. I'm going to click on more extension results because I want to see more than just the three that they list here by default. And the tool that we like to use is called Awesome Screenshot. There are a lot of others that are valuable as well. Uh, I would encourage you to explore those. Um, we like this one because it's simple to use. It's pretty power powerful. It allows you to um, crop and annotate your screenshots. There are some others that will also allow you to record video. So depending on what your needs are, you might explore those. And a lot of them are free. So you'll notice that I have screenshots right here of the tools, like I would within all of uh, the, the apps or extensions within the store. I can see ratings. I can get multiple details with views. Um, I can try it out before I add it. Okay, so it's showing me right here that I've already added it to my Chrome browser. And you can see the icon for it right here. Okay. So if I wanted to use that, I would click on it, okay? And it's showing me, it opens a, a tab, and it's giving me the instructions, right? Showing me how I can use it. Okay, so if I wanted to go ahead and use this, now I can click, and it's showing me all the different functions I can do. I can select just a certain area, I can select the whole screen, and again, I can do all the cropping and manipulation I might want to do afterward as well. Okay, so that's, the awesome screenshot. Uh, a few others I'll mention in terms of the uh, extensions. This is a nice one, again, if you are using Google Drive, um, a tool that will allow you to save things that you find on the web directly to Google Drive. So no more downloading and uploading it or sending a link or different things like that. Um, you can go directly that way. So if I click on this. I can say, well, I'm on, I'm in the Chrome store, so it's not going to let me save that. If I had a PDF up, for example, or a web page that I might want to save for later, I can do that. Okay. And again, this one's free and, and available within the web store. And I believe it's called Save to Google Drive, so it's an easy one to find. Uh, another one 
one that we like and that you saw at the beginning of the presentation is the Goob shortener. So if you are sharing URLs with your class, for example, often, and you end up with very long URLs, um, there are a few different programs and websites out there that will allow you to do a shortened version of it, so you don't have to list a long URL that people might have to type. Um, the nice thing about the Google one, I'll, I'll mention a few things. One is that um, because it's Google, you know that it's going to be something that's going to be open for others to use. You're not going to have that block in different filtering systems. The other thing is that when you set up your uh, Google shortened URL, you can um, also set a QR code, which we saw at the beginning of the presentation. So a little multicolored or multi-pattern box right here that allows uh, smartphones to be able to scan to find a URL. It sets those up all within a single site. You can also then go in and manage yours. So if you've created multiple Google shortened URLs, you can go in and you can find what was the one I created a month ago. You can go in and find that again. So it allows you to manage that again all through your kind of Google environment. Okay. So a little bit of an overview again of extensions, and the presentation has a lot of that as well. Um, I touched on a lot of these. Um, I'll just mention one other that I uh, have right up here. You can see is a little uh, convert text to speech. So that's kind of a nice tool. You can be on a page, and you can highlight it, and it will speak aloud the text that you're on. And so that one's right here as well. Um, one more, as you start to add a lot of extensions, I mentioned it's going to kind of grow the area right next to your uh, address bar up there. Um, the nice thing about installing the extension manager, which again is an extension available in the store, is it allows you to uh, have all of your extensions under one management tool, as well as it allows you to be able to turn extensions on and off, delete them, do different kinds of things all through a single interface, rather than having to go into each extension to, to make certain adjustments. Okay, and Tracy's going to speak about WebEx. So now that you've seen some enhancements that you can do to your browsing window and when you're actually within a Chrome browser that just kind of adds features for you, we're going to actually look at the apps that he mentioned that either enhances your browsing experience or takes you directly to websites that um, will either engage with your Google Drive, Drive or be usable offline or different features like that. So I'm going to try to cover a wide array of just different subject areas that you might find something that applies to your area that you're teaching or to people within your district or at your site. So the first thing, again, as he had mentioned, um, when he was looking at it before, he was pulling up and saw the apps versus the extensions. We're going to be focused on apps. And um, sometimes you'll find that a particular topic that you're looking for will have an extension as well as an app. So the first area we're looking at is the lesson planning. And that is um, a couple of ones that we found. It's a common curriculum lesson planner. And this is a great way to collaborate with other um, colleagues to make your lessons. If you're doing a math lesson, you're able to work together on, on what it might be for your week, weekly plan. It does everything digitally for you. It also aligns to the Common Core state standards, which is very important right now And when you're creating your units and your lessons. It's a way for you to just basically take everything that might have been pen and paper in the past in your little lesson plan book and put it into a digital version instead. So this one, great way to res uh, use your resources, look at the long-term project of your you know, plan for the year for your units, also looking at short-term things for the daily lesson that you're trying to narrow down to. So this one's a great one, curriculum, or common curriculum, the double C that you'll see. And then also Ed Puzzle. These two, this one also allows you to take your current, um, maybe a video that you have, and um, or a lesson and make into a video. So what it will do is allow you to um, embed quizzes, your voiceover, and different features within that video as you're um, showing and sharing kind of a lesson with your students. You could almost use this in even like a flipped um, lesson plan if you wanted to kind of flip the lesson, give them a video, crop it, add your voice, ask a question for the students to answer and then maybe um, give a, an assessment piece at the end of the video to see 
uh, a check for understanding on what they've learned through that um, process. So it's a great feature. Those are two kinds of things to help enhance curriculum and also enhance how you're going about planning for your year and hopefully cutting back from paper and going more digital. All right, if you haven't um, been able to look at this before in the past, it's something that's um, offering a lot of free textbooks and some of the districts and classes have new material for the math um, curriculum, but some are looking at other resources. So this does include math, science, and other topics. And you're able to go in and create either your own flex book, is what they call it, um, and pull material that is already um, available to um, add and create your own book and save that. Or you can also go in and use somebody else's flex book, which might have been created by another teacher in a different district. Um, uh, these are all um, resources that are covering anywhere from uh, videos, quizzes, the actual activities and problems for them to practice, and it all goes through many different things, and it's pretty simple to use. It gives you a lot of options when you first create it. I suggest just starting out with some of the ones that are created at first from somebody else and get a feel for it, see where you would want to then take some pieces and maybe apply it or pull it into your lessons. And the nice thing is you don't have to use the entire textbook, but maybe you want just part of it to use throughout the year. So it's a great um, resource by a nonprofit um, called CK12. The other ones that um, we're looking at right now are classroom management. These, with all the ways that students are bringing in their phones into the classrooms, and everyone seems to have their own personal smartphones or devices, um, even if there, um, some classrooms are now going one-to-one -one and other districts you might have carts that come into your classroom, you could even use that in some sense. But just in general, between parents having the availability of a um, texting ability and students, this is um, a thing called Remind. And this is a way that you can safely message between a teacher to students and parents. It's a great resource. You can uh, you don't have to be seeing their phone number and they aren't seeing your own phone number so that's a safe environment and you can get a private message back and forth between a parent which might be an easier method during the day while you're teaching and not able to get to the computer and send an email you might on your break be able to send a text message or an update um, you might also send out messages to your students a reminder of a homework or a quiz or a flipped question of what maybe um, you want them to review over the evening or a video they might want to check out. So those are some of the different features, but it is a nice thing that does allow you a free messaging safe environment between that um, two-way communication. The other one that's really fun and um, a great resource is called Class Charts. And this interacts with a lot of the student information systems. For instance, PowerSchool, you can have that um, student information system um, integrate with this so that it actually would upload your classroom uh, data. So if you have a science class at the high school, it would provide you all their names and information. And if you have the pictures, that little thumbnail can actually go and be a part of this. If you don't have uh, the pictures, you can actually change it or they give you little, um, like little icons that are just cartoon-like characters if you want to use that too. Maybe that would be more appropriate with the elementary level or something, but you, know, you can actually put the real faces to the names. And what it is, is it's a great way to kind of track how things are going within the classroom. You can do seating assignments, changing them into different types of collaborations for groups. Um, you can have partners. You can do it by levels. Um, you can change it by a variety of ways. And so it is a nice way that you don't have to actually physically think out what are my groups going to be and it kind of does this for you. The other thing that I really liked about it is if you have a special meeting with a parent um, for um, progress on a student, for instance, maybe you're doing a student um, study team on a student to make sure that they're progressing and understanding um, and having their, um, seeing what's going on within their classroom. As a teacher, you can kind of go in and say, um, here are some of the things on how they're behaving within the classroom. You're able to go and do little updates along the way. 
and it will actually provide you charts and data on either individual or whole, whole class assignment things. So it's a great thing to maybe even take to an IEP meeting, FST, or an individual parent conference if you want specific data. Um, and also it allows you to contact and um, interact back and forth to those parents as you do the um, classroom management tool. So if you haven't um, had an opportunity um, as you are going along any of these, and we'll have this available afterwards, when we collected them, we would just put the names in, and then all of the ones that we're sharing right now end up being a free um, ad for, I'm sorry, free app that you can just add to your account. So feel free to add any of these as we're going along if they apply for you. All right, so student engagement. How do you get the students to kind of get involved instead of just being in their seats and sitting and getting the material given to them by notes and not really having a lot of chance to engage sometimes in a classroom setting? This one uh, is a nice tool that you can use. It's uh, Socrative. Uh, they have the teacher version and student version. They can use it on a mobile device if they have a phone. Uh, if they have an iPad, any type of device, you can actually go in via the websites, too. And what it allows you to do are fun little um, exit tickets, so you can do an assessment on how students are understanding what's going on for the lesson. You can also do a space race where they can get in a team, and they have little spaceships that go a long <coughs> way. And these little spaceships will allow them to kind of group up in a group, do a little challenge, see if they're understanding uh, the lesson answers some, you know, can be five questions, ten questions, and as they go along, the spaceship starts moving. They get, even high schoolers get extremely <coughs> excited over this one, and they're trying, they like the challenge. They like to see, and they're all getting in, uh, interested in trying to answer the questions. Uh, you also have different opportunities to put quizzes and quick questions in there as well. And what's nice about it is it will pro um, provide you a data chart afterwards. You can download it in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, you can uh, visually see where your students are on their understanding. And if you want to show to the class, oh, this team has this answer, do we agree or not agree, you can, it actually allows you to open up the door to have discussion about maybe why one answer might not be correct or might be correct according to the way that they are seeing it. So you have to, it gives a nice visual and it also is something that you can save and use for other things. And I've also seen this used by teachers to do um, a exit ticket at the end of their day and then to see what they had um, trouble with learning or maybe even what they understood the most and that helped drive the instruction the next day, and then they would take uh, the spreadsheet, take all the words that were in that, and put it into a Wordle, and that Wordle then pops up the, the words that are most frequently used, makes them the biggest, and that teacher was then able to say, this is the trouble spot my students are not understanding. This word is popping up over and over, fractions, for instance, and they did not understand this. So that way that could drive the instruction for the uh, teacher the next day to either modify the lesson based on some just quick, really easy assessments. Now, if most students have phones, but not all do, so I've seen it done where just maybe a handful of kids in the classroom have a phone, and then they just group up, and then the teacher simply sends out the classroom room number, and then it pops up on their phone and they get to answer as a team. So you can collaborate with a group and try to use it. Another thing that I've seen is that teachers have taken parents' old phones that were donated, and they don't have to have a SIM card or any data plan associated to it, and they just simply use the Wi-Fi part of it, and then the donated old phone becomes the device in the classroom. So it seems like something so simple, but it is something that is available and a lot of parents don't have any use for their old phones and they can clear it, start it back at factory settings, you don't have to have a data plan. <coughs> as long as your school has the Wi-Fi capability, a, a donated phone works really good. All right, so study tools, a couple of them. Study stack is gonna give you flashcards, hangman games, different ways for the kids to engage and uh, maybe 
learn vocabulary words, also could um, be just a different way of having, you know, something that they do miss, maybe have to memorize, but instead of just using the traditional index card, it's just a different version, and it might make it a little more fun turning it in a crossword puzzle or a game-like situ situation. Um, and then iVocab is really fun. It allows you to practice for SAT exams or English vocabulary. It gives you uh, short little quizzes on your vocab, and I was practicing this, and it really is um, usable. It has a lot of things that you'll go through, and it will actually let you, if you sign in, it will let you keep the words and track how well you do, and it will tell you your score, and then you can also go back and review the ones that you did not get right. So it just increases those repetitive vocab and prep for those big tests for the high school students. All right, for students now taking, instead of the teacher version of planning their lessons online, this is now kind of, it could be used by teachers, but this is, to me, I see it as the student version, uh, taking a, a planner, and instead of them having to forget what is happening in their classroom and what they have for the week, this will allow you to actually interact with your students, send out messages about incoming assignments, updating any homework that's due, or even reminding them about exams. So you can also collaborate with other teachers on this and lectures, and it allows you to see your daily um, agenda, what exams and classes you have for the day, and what tasks you have, and what's coming ahead. So really teaching them how to plan and um, so many teachers go around and have the student write it in a little planner and that planner never really makes it home and then the parent never really sees it and I think that most, uh, most of the kids, at least middle school to high school, would most likely be more engaged if it's digital like this version. Alright, just to update students getting a more um, chance and opportunity to have um, opportunity for reading, this allows you to look at daily news articles, but it does it in different reading levels. So it's from grades third grade through 12th grade, and it also has the five different levels of reading. So if you have a variety of students in one classroom, you can gauge their reading level to their ability, and um, put, if they're on grade level, then they might even have different um, reading levels within that, or they can be behind a grade, or advanced in their reading, so it really kind of allows you to let each student be um, differentiated at the level where they are, and gives them more opportunity to learn about current events and have a little bit more news brought into their literacy piece of their learning. So math and English language arts, a few that are popular out there. Uh, the first one, IXL, some districts um, actually have a paid version of this, but there is a free version, and it allows you to have a lot of different um, resources with math and language arts, and it has different practice um, problems, it aligns to the standards, it gives you different reports, um, all different options within there, so a lot of resources, teachers like that site. Um, I recommend um, kind of using that app and driving the grade level that you're looking for or the subject area, if it happens to be language arts or math, that's a great resource for you. Uh, in terms of maybe a high school type or mid middle school graphing calculator, um, Desmos is a really nice feature. It allows you to do a whole bunch of different manipulations, animations, you're able to move the points, put in different data points, see how things change. You don't, you know, this one, you can look at the slope of the line or where most of the um, function is um, how it's mo modeling out. It's a, a nice visual for students. Instead of them just doing it on, uh, plotting it on graph paper, you have the actual um, animation version of this. And uh, Math Papa, it is aligning to a lot of the algebra lessons that are being taught today to Common Core. And it also has an algebra calculator it gives math practice and math help. So um, students might actually, they may go to this and they could either do a lesson, but they actually will allow them to put in a homework problem and help solve it, um, but, <laughs> which could be a disadvantage, right? Because now they don't have to do it. But 
by just even looking and taking the time to get that far, they're making, they're walking through steps, and hopefully um, it is possible that they can learn some of it. The things that I like about it, not so much the one that allows you to just pop in a homework problem or try something, is the lessons and the practice piece of it. Uh, the other one is GeoGebra, and this one, again, another graphing calculator. Uh, I think this one allows you to interject um, pictures even, and like in one of the math um, geometry classes I was in last week, they were looking at the symmetry of a face and how everybody has different um, features. And they were looking at a picture of a face and then taking half of it and doing two left sides of your face and then doing two right sides of your face. And it was really fun to see how that changed the look of you and also um, it was allowing you to look at the symmetry and the geometry. It was a really cool like learning lesson and taking that piece from just simply having the kids take a picture, pop it into this lesson, and then make it an engaging piece to graph out and look at it. So, fun little site, lots of use with it. All right, history, two features I love. <laughs> Getting just a little update on different historic events. They're super so many in one day that I'm sure just even as a teacher you might just find something that would be a feature that you could share with the students and giving them uh, little history lessons and uh, it give you a timeline and you couldn't possibly cover all of them but it does give you more information about it and it gives you some news about the what happened on that particular day in history. Uh, this one, the Ancient History Encyclopedia just has a ton of resources with maps interactive timelines, has books, it has video, and you can almost find a majority of your topics in history and support it back into your curriculum at some point. All right, there is a lot of science apps out there, and a lot of them are related to anatomy and biology, um, so you'll find a ton of different um, study ones related to the bones and the human anatomy. This one's fun, you can actually just put in different questions and maybe present some scientific method ideas and asking questions and it directs you to different topics. Um, instead of going and doing a virtual, I mean this is a virtual dissection of a frog, instead of, you know, most of us do not, they do not have the option of um, having those ordered sometimes in the schools, it gives them a really live version. It looks really fun and it's pretty neat. So if you haven't tried that one, I recommend doing it. It doesn't take more than a minute. And you, in a couple minutes, you're dissecting it. tells you exactly what to do and you really can see inside that frog. It looks pretty um, live and real. Um, astronomy, science tutor, and then the a periodic table, all of which are just a few of the ones that we found that were helpful. But there are tons of resources. Once you jump onto one topic, the related button gives you a whole bunch more that are similar, and it also has reviews, so I highly recommend looking at the review, read about it a little bit, it gives you an idea if it's gonna be something usable or not. And the reviews to me have been very helpful. They actually seem to be quite accurate of what I've read and then tested. So fun ones that are useful out there, Typing Club with um, all the students now having more keyboarding skills needed, especially with Smarter Balance testing. They are providing really great little resources. Typing Club gives awards, um, it tracks their progress, lets them look at their accuracy, gives them a guided lesson, gives them typing time. Uh, Nearpod it gives you a mobile device kind of control over if you happen to have a cart of devices. Nearpod is a great solution for those mobile devices pushing out material out into the classroom. And then we video, fun little video, gives you a free um, certain amount of space that you can create um, on we video under the education one. And then if you add more features and more video, there's different pricing. And then Lucid Press is just a different version of if you're doing anything like publication wise, it's just a nice little uh, different than going into a Word doc, but it has a lot of publication material that's fun. So, last one that I'm just going to cover is, um, if you haven't seen it, this is a really fun 
it says it's an interactive storyboard, but how tune, if you think of like the cartoons and things, you know, the pow, bing, buck, you know, all that, it's actually a fun way of doing like a PowerPoint instead. It has animations, little bubbles, you get to put all these features in, and it, um, students like it, it's a, it's a great one. Um, then the other one's Real Time Cube, it's a puzzle, you know, cube that they're solving the real time collaborative environment. And then a comic strip and avatar. A lot of the avatar sites are popular, creating their little image. And Games Galore will have just a ton of different choices in there. So that's more of the fun side of things. So hopefully some of those will apply to something that you are able to work with. So following up with uh, Tracy's presentation of a lot of the different free educational apps, um, there's an integration point that you may not know about. If you go into your Google Drive, if you're used to using Google Drive, um, and go to create, uh, when you can go through, typically you can go through and create a document or a spreadsheet or something like that. But if you go to connect more apps, you can add a lot of apps that you would find also in the App Store. Um, the reason you might want to add them this way is it allows you to take the documents and spreadsheets and different things that you've created uh, within uh, Google Drive and be able to manipulate them, so all within this one environment. Um, the other nice thing is it allows you to be able to not have to be in a Google Chrome browser because, of course, the Google Drive environment is accessible in, in all different browsers and platforms. Um, so you can be able to have that functionality and not be wed to the browser like you would be with the other apps and extensions that you were looking at before. So this is where you would go to add those and you can browse through and see which different ones. A lot of the ones that Tracy was mentioning are available within the App Store as well, or rather within the, the integration with the Drive. Add-ons, kind of similar, um, you can add functionality um, within a Google Doc or a Google Spreadsheet. Um, and so you can go in and I'll show you where you would find that. Um, one of the ones that I want to mention is an easy bit. It's a nice one for education because you're able to have built-in citation tools. Um, so as you're going through and a student is working on their presentation or their um, uh, paper that they're working on, um, they can go through, put in the URL for a website that they might be referencing in their work, and it will build the citation for them in multiple different formats and allow them to add that easily into their document. Uh, MindMeister is a nice tool for being able to create mind maps. So if you have a bulleted list, for example, um, uh, you know, you're putting together a paper and you have your bulleted list of your index for your paper, um, you might use that and to create a mind map to a visual representation of what you put together there. Uh, a few other good ones, there's a thesaurus tool that's built in. Um, and then there are also some add-ons that are specific just for sheets. Um, so obviously the ability to look up in a large document to remove any kind of duplicates, the ability to um, do a mail merge. Um, uh, I know Tracy has uh, used Fluguru a bit speak to that. Um, so there's a lot of different ones that you can explore, and I'll show you quickly where you can find those. So if you aren't already, I'll pull up a drive so you can see how that works. So from within my drive, I'll just create a new doc right here. And you'll notice a menu item at the top called add-ons. Okay, so I already have a few add-ons installed here, so it's showing me those. Um, otherwise, I can do click, click the get add-ons, and again, it's going to give me an interface similar to the Chrome Store, where I can find add-ons that are specifically built to work within Google, uh, within Drive, and within Docs, or if I was in spreadsheets. Okay, so that's where I would add those. And again, if I was in spreadsheets, I would have a different set that were available to me. So uh, mailing labels, for example, uh, if, if I was doing that in spreadsheets. One of the nice things about uh, using those tools as well is if, uh, you know, the benefit of, of doing creating documents and sharing documents within Google Drive is that you can collaborate. If I have done some work that really relies on some of these add-ons for their functionality, um, when I share it with someone else, that functionality is shared with that person as well. So then if they go into that document and go into add-ons, they have that add-on shared with them as well. So it's not going to break the functionality of their document. Mm -hmm. So anything else you want to add? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, 
so what, what better way to end than to show a little uh, funny video, maybe? <laughs> So just in case you haven't seen this cartoon of how do your students view you, and it says, I heard she has eyes in the back of her head, but I suspect more likely it's some combination of Google Glass and a smartwatch. So now with all the teachers out there using Google Glass and different people that you see on the street, so, and should I show? And if you haven't seen this, this is the guy from Cash Cab, and Quick little, oh, it's not going to let us see. Do we not have enough sound? be sharing this one right now but just in case you haven't looked at these series they're really funny and great things how kids react and they have all different topics and this one is a great one on how they react to old technology and the computer and it's really funny actually mm -hmm. so um, highly recommend these are by um, fine brothers on the YouTube channel so it's available and they have old cell phones and you name it, toaster, the old toaster, everything you can think of, they have it they're reacting to it. So here's our contact information and if you have any questions or you want the presentation, there's the QR code for it and we'd be happy to share it out for you. So thanks again for coming today and 